All right, guys, I think we'll get started. If I can have your attention, please. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for coming. This is the eighth in this uh, Archives Public Lecture Series. Um, as you know, we're setting up an archive at NCBS, um, setting it up as a space for the history of contemporary biology in India. And we should be opening sometime early next year. Um, this series is one of hopefully many attempts that we try and make to sort of make these bridges with a broader community and have conversations around historical context around different aspects in the sciences. Um, and I'm uh, really pleased to have Sunil here. We've been having a conversation about this talk for many months now, and I'm really glad uh, we're able to do this today. Um, Sunil, for those of you who don't know, um, is the executive director and co-founder of the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore. CIS, which was formed in 2008, is a policy and academic research organization that focuses on accessibility for the disabled, intellectual property rights, policy reform, internet governance, and really brought yet openness at various levels, um, software, standards, content, access, educational resources. Um, Sunil has, of course, been engaged with some of these issues for over two decades now. In 1998, he co-founded Mahiti, a social enterprise aiming to reduce the cost and complexity of information and communication technologies for the voluntary sector by using free software. Mahidi employs more than 50 engineers today and continues to work, and Sunil um, is on the board of uh, the company. In 99, um, he was elected as an Ashoka Fellow to, quote, explore the democratic potential of the Internet, and was also later granted a Sarai um, Floss Fellowship in 2003. For a few years after that, he managed the International Open Source Network, a project of the United Nations Development Program's Asia-Pacific Development Information Program, which served 42 countries in the Asia-Pacific region. We're uh, very, very lucky to have him here also because there are very, um, there's some interesting transitions around the corner for him. Earlier this year, the Mozilla Foundation appointed Sunil as the new Vice President for Leadership Programs and as, a, as an advisor to uh, Mozilla's executive team and directors. He'll be moving to Berlin for this new role starting January of 2019. I'm just going to quote from the announcement to wrap this introduction up because I think uh, they do a much better job of this than I could possibly do. Um, and they say, I quote, um, during our search, we stated a goal of finding someone with deep experience working on some aspect of internet health and having a proven true track record of building high impact organizations and teams. In Sunil, we have managed to find just that. Sunil is truly off the movement and is perfectly positioned to help us, Mozilla, bring a strong cadre of internet health leaders all around the world. So we're so pleased to have him here and I hope uh, we have an interesting discussion afterwards. Thanks, Venkat. That was a very generous uh, introduction. When people introduce me like that, then there are perhaps higher expectations of a talk that I will give. Therefore, I have to uh, temper those expectations by telling you that I'm only a charlatan. I have a bachelor's degree in industrial production engineering. I've never been trained to do the work that I have done. Uh, somehow, I've been in various situations where this work has happened. So. Uh, please don't believe uh, most of the things that Venkat said about me. Uh, I'm here mostly to s share stories about uh, surveillance. Uh, many years ago, I was uh, at a partner retreat organized by a funder or funding organization and another partner, and that was Privacy International. The gentleman, Gus Hussain, came to me and said, oh, isn't privacy an important issue in India? And, uh, and this is roughly 10 years ago, and I told him, Oh, in India, nobody cares about privacy. So that was my starting point. It's only 10 years of uh, this journey, where now, even if I walk down an ordinary street or look into a classroom, all I can think about and all I can see is surveillance. So uh, before, uh, before we take on more complicated uh, problems which are connected to surveillance, let's deal with the most easiest one. This is uh, a university in Bangalore, of course, the photograph is just representative. And uh, I had gone there for a full day conference at this university. Uh, the day was divided into two parts. Uh, there was the initial part where uh, the guests gave uh, guest uh, addresses. And then the student conference continued where students presented to one another. 
uh, academic papers. So during the first part, apart from me and another gentleman from Bangalore, there was a sitting judge of the Supreme Court, and three of us were meant to speak as part of the inaugural session. And what was very curious, it was a big hall and uh, close to, I think, 400 students in the hall, but the hall could easily seat 800 uh, people. Uh, on both sides of the aisles, there were students and teachers patrolling. Uh, the students in this institution seemed to be incapable of two things. Uh, the first was staying awake, so they would constantly fall asleep, like the picture on the slideshow. And if uh, they were woken, because the people doing the patrolling, when they noticed a sleeping student, especially a student who was sleeping with his mouth wide open, they would tap the student on his or her shoulder and wake him or her up. And as soon as they woke up uh, and they were awake, they were unable to stay silent. So they immediately they would start speaking or whispering to the person sitting next to them. And then the people doing the patrolling would come to them and tap them on their shoulder again or shush them and say that you're not supposed to talk. Uh, so this was when the inaugural session happened and when the students started presenting their papers, the problem got uh, even worse. Uh, now there were aisles uh, in the middle of the hall, and now we had both students and teachers patrolling uh, the aisle in the middle of the hall as well. So twice the amount of patrolling, but still very ineffective policing because students constantly fell asleep uh, or uh, continued to chatter. So this is uh, a surveillance uh, question. How do we organize surveillance during an academic seminar? And perhaps some of you have thought about this important question. Uh, the way to do this in a completely different approach would be to say that let's use a randomizer. Let's all submit uh, to the tyranny of a machine. So all students have roll numbers, and there's a randomizer right up in front. Every now and then, regardless of what's happening during the academic conference, the randomizer will call a random student name, and then the random student has to come up in front and uh, summarize the discussion to, uh, that has taken place since the last time the randomizer called the student's name. So you can see here that you don't need uh, surveillance, you don't need uh, patrolling in the aisles on the side of the room, nor do you need patrolling in the aisles in the middle of the room. You just use a simple machine and it's seen as fair because anybody could be pulled, somebody could be talking but still paying attention, somebody could be sleeping and still be paying attention. All you're doing is working on the policy goal. So that's uh, story number one for you, and this is from uh, just a year ago and an experience in Bangalore. So uh, what I'm hoping to do is to get you obsessed about surveillance. So very quick question before we go there. How is uh, anklets, which women wear, how is anklets a surveillance, de surveillance device? Can anybody think about anklets that women wear as a surveillance device? How does it act as a surveillance device? Yes. Is that clear? So that's just jewelry. You can look at jewelry and you can see surveillance technology. Okay? And this has been going on for a long time, for two, more than 2,000 years at least. Uh, and this is the problem statement, which is if you have to run an effective state, then you have to do surveillance. There is, it's impossible for a state to function without surveillance. We must have surveillance. Surveillance is a good thing, despite what all the NGO ballers will tell you. We must have surveillance. The question is, how do we go about doing this surveillance? Uh, in the Atashastra, of course, everybody has to be put under surveillance, except for the king or the prime minister himself, I guess. It's gendered time, so it would have been himself. Apart from those two people, the rest of the domestic state and all foreign states, every party has to be put under surveillance. These are the national security reasons which most people will remember when they think of the Arthashastra, because you don't want conspiracies against the king, but more banal reasons as well, such as tax collection. How to make sure people are paying the tax that they're meant to pay, even in the Arthashastra, even today, as the government in India is discussing surveillance on social media for tax collection, looking at your holiday pictures. If you're paying only so much tax, how can you afford a holiday in Bangkok? It's the same principle. And this is 2,000 years ago, 
And this was already happening in this country. So this very old tradition of statecraft and the question before all of us is how to get it right. And we're going to go through several case studies to understand this. Does anybody in the room remember the Infosys HR manager murdering his wife? Anybody? This is a Bangalore story. People remember this? This is a Bangalore story. Yeah, this is a Bangalore story. The murder, murder was in Bangalore. So uh, here is uh, Satish Kumar Gupta, and that's his wife. A couple of months before the murder, he said, I have got a surprise for you. It's a surprise gift. Uh, you have to, I have to blindfold you before I give you the gift. So he blindfolded her, put her on a seat, then made her hold uh, brand new jewelry that he had bought for her. She opened her blindfold. She was pleasantly surprised. She had uh, new jewelry. On the day of the murder, he takes her phone and puts it in his right pocket and puts his phone in his left pocket. Both phones don't have GPS features. They're regular feature phones. He tells her the same story that I've got a gift for you, blindfolds her and slits her neck. Then he goes out with his friend for jogging. On uh, the jogging track, he uses his wife's phone to call his phone, and then pretends to receive the call using his phone, and then tells his friend, hey, there is some kind of crisis at home. I have to go home. And he rushes home with his friend, and there his wife already murdered. His friend is his alibi. How did the Bangalore police crack the case? Both phones don't have GPS. The jewelry? Sorry? The jewelry? No. It's purely digital surveillance, which was used to crack the case. How did the Bangalore police crack the case? The mobile stations. The mobile stations. So even if your phone does not have a GPS uh, receiver, a GPS antenna, which can be used by GPS functionality on the device. Your phone is constantly pinging the three closest cell phone towers and recording the signal strength that it receives as it pings each of those cell phone towers. And using simple mathematical triangulation of those single signal strengths, you can determine that both phones were exactly in the same place. Now, the Infosys HR manager clearly does not know enough about digital technologies, but Bangalore's taxi drivers do. There was a jeweler from Andhra Pradesh who came to Bangalore, and for a week he used exactly the same taxi driver. He was very careless. Often he left his briefcase in this taxi, and the briefcase was unlocked. The briefcase was full of jewelry and cash. The taxi driver noticed this on several occasions. The taxi driver decided to kill and rob the jeweler. On the final day, as the jeweler was making his journey back to the Bangalore airport, the taxi driver asked the jeweler to sign the receipt at the hotel itself, because he said, at Bangalore airport, it's a lot of crowd, so therefore it'll be good if you sign the receipts now, which he did. Uh, the, they both got into the taxi. On the way, uh, they were accosted by another taxi full of friends of this taxi driver. And they took the jeweler and the briefcase, money, jewelry, etc., shifted it into the second car. They left the phone in the first car. Yeah, they didn't shift the phone. And then the taxi driver drives with just the phone all the way to the Bangalore airport, makes sure he parks somewhere where there are no CCTV cameras, and then chucks the phone into the dustbin in the Bangalore airport and then drives home. How did the police? Crack this case. Again, pure electronic surveillance data. There was no other reason. Any, any guesses on how the police solved this case? <coughs> no, the toll record was clean. Oh, you, cameras at the toll gates? Uh, I don't know if they were used, but that was not the method of cracking the case. This is uh, 2012. 2012. So that's one good suggestion. There could have been record on the surveillance cameras at the toll gates. No, this is pure telecom. Yes. So maybe time uh, between the murder, which is the sixth 
No, they never moved the phone. The phone they kept in the original car. Yes, but when the car moved, then the car... Okay, that the car stopped. The car stopped for a little time. Okay, that's... Uh, uh, it seems strange that the car stopped for this additional time. That's good. But they had clinching evidence, much better evidence, which I shall... If nobody else has the answer, I will go ahead. Uh, basically, this taxi driver and his friends, they had a standard pattern on their call records. They would call every Friday to meet for drinks. That week, very strangely, they made many more phone calls, planning the conspiracy. And then all they had to do is watch all those other phones, and they could tell where they killed the jeweler. Yeah, so it's not, when, when somebody does surveillance on you, they don't have to do surveillance on you. They just have to do surveillance on the people that you care for or the people that you work with. Um, this is a much easier one. Rajat Gupta and Raj Raj Ratnam. When the pro public prosecutor presented the evidence in front of the jury, there was nothing in the payload. There was nothing incriminating in the payload. Payload is the actual content. In the phone calls, there was nothing incriminating. Um, but still, the jury held Rajat Gupta guilty. I'm not telling this story because I think most people know this insider trading story. Um, what, what swayed the jury? What piece of electronic records swayed the jury and said that, yes, Rajat Gupta is 100% guilty? Guesses? Yes, but what, what was the next pattern? In another database, there was a pattern. Time transfer. Time transfer. Stock, uh, stock trades, stock market trades. How come uh, Raj Raj Ratnam always traded immediately after these calls? And how come those trades were on stocks that were connected to those meetings? So uh, again, a uh, very simple piece of electronic, uh, and here I think the main point in this story is that the metadata tells you much more than the payload data. Often we are under the impression that payload is what is valuable, but as far as uh, law enforcement is concerned, metadata has got most of the magic. Osama bin Laden's compound, uh, and this is a fake story. This is not really a story. Uh, in a water bath. If we were going to find, use electronic evidence to find Osama, what would we notice in the databases? What would be the pattern in the database? He was not caught using electronic <laughs> surveillance. <laughs> he was very careful. He never used a phone. He never had a broadband connection in this place. All his computers in the compound were offline. What, but what would have been the pattern if you had data from every telecom company in the area that served a bot above? Say, so you don't have yes. So if you don't see a pattern in the database, that is also a pattern. Mm -hmm. If somebody is going, uh, if somebody is going dark on the internet, if there is a whole university and nobody uses Tor except you then you're doing something suspicious on the internet. So even not having a pattern is, in fact, a pattern. Um, so it's not just the state using electronic surveillance to uphold the law. It is also possible for investigative journalists to hold the state to account when the state indulges in violence. This is um, an occasion when uh, 20 were killed by the Andhra police. This is the Red Sanders scandal. Again, this is a couple of years ago, uh, 2015. And the state and the police had one version of the story where they claimed that these were actually terrorists or criminals. And uh, using CDR data from four of the people, including one person who they followed, for which there was CDR data all the points to the ad ad arrest, they were able to prove that this was encounter killing. So great example, great case study of how CDR data was used to prove that there was an encounter by the state. 
Um, so I'm going to now shift gears a little bit. Those are uh, civilian stories. I'm now going to talk a little bit about privacy by design and how technology uh, can be used to implement privacy by design. In This is from, from quite some time ago. This is 2003, and I think this is from uh, Korea, but there, are, there have been similar, similar developments in Japan. After the invention of digital photography, both in Korea and in Japan, massive explosion in a phenomena, a voyeuristic phenomena, called upskirt photography. And to counter this phenomena, which could be understood as some kind of citizen surveillance, or voyeurism, more, more simply, but to counter this phenomena, both regulators in Japan and in Korea made proposals uh, along these lines. What their proposal said is that manufacturers of cell phones or digital cameras should not be allowed to turn off the notification. When you click a digital camera, you hear the sound of an analog shutter. There is no analog shutter in a digital camera. The shutter is completely digital. It's just an MP3 recording of an analog shutter that is being played along with your click. So what the law here says, and it didn't go through, it became a self-regulatory code. The government didn't have to actually enact a law. The industry just got together and implemented the standard. Uh, so it's impossible from the feature, from the interface of the device, to turn off the notification, to turn off the red light that will come on when a video camera is functioning, or the shutter sound that will play when a still camera is functioning. So this is technical means that are used to protect privacy. And we're going to go through a variety of technical means and projects to understand how this can be done. So, uh, after thinking about surveillance for uh, about 10 years now, I've come to some conclusions and I'm going to share those conclusions with you. We're going to discuss them and we'll try and end with one big case study at the end. And I'd like to open out that case study for discussion. This case study is inspired by two very important moments in the feminist movement. The first is the Me Too moment, uh, which I think everybody has to respond to today. And the second is uh, what to do with transgender persons when it comes to toilets. So we will combine both those problem statements and make one massive problem statement. And then I'll give you some of the thoughts I've had on how to resolve this. But uh, let's work towards that case study. Um, is it already 45 minutes? It's a countdown for an hour, is it? OK, thank you. Um, so this is one of the first posters that we put together when we were thinking about the UID project. Uh, I don't think it's all very clear, so I'll just explain it. Uh, there's a fair price shop, and there is a customer at this fair price shop using biometric authentication to access, or access subsidized grain. In the first uh, panel, the person says UID rejected because the person is illiterate. The person may not know better. Or the person pretends that there's no connectivity or says there's no electricity or says that uh, the UID is accepted, but I'll give you only half the rations. Uh, and uh, you could also be coerced to put your fingerprint on the biometric reader. So that's a variety of scenarios through which a technical safeguard can be very easily bypassed by people on the ground, on the field. So surveillance does not, especially technologically enabled surveillance, uh, does not really always ensure that you will reach the end policy goal. When we, when we used humans for surveillance, they would have noticed this. Uh, during the Kautalya time, if a human being had gone to the ration shop, they would have noticed that this is going on. But if you try to be a presenceless government, if you decide that you don't want to be present in the villages and small towns of India, and you're going to do everything remote control from New Delhi, then there are problems with that type of thinking, because it's easy 
to tamper with uh, the system and to beat the system. So this is a standard uh, critique against techno-utopianism. You must have heard this a hundred times. I'm not going to read it. Uh, it's very tempting. And when we reach the post-gender toilet, at that point you'll realize why tempering our techno-determinism, tempering our techno-utopianism is key when coming up with surveillance solutions. Can surveillance make the situation worse? That's also easily possible. Uh, in the Arthashastra, we saw that one of the main policy imperatives for surveillance was security of the state. So could you have the reverse? Could you undermine the security of the state by unnecessarily doing mass surveillance? And this is a simple infographic to help you understand this. If we say that uh, surveillance of every institution uh, is important and every home is important to prevent some kind of offense, maybe a Me Too crime, uh, then the government could say that we want a copy of everybody's keys to your residences and to your offices so that whenever there is a possibility of an offense occurring, we can come into your premises and uh, monitor or collect evidence and so on. So that could be an argument that is made. But when it comes to physical keys, we're all very clear that nobody wants to collect all the keys of all the homes and offices in Bangalore and leave it with the police. That does not make Bangalore more secure. But uh, when it comes to biometrics, we don't seem to extend this argument. For some reason, we think a 13-foot wall will keep all our biometrics safe. But it's the same thing. Roughly, there is no difference between putting all the keys of the citizens of Bangalore in one police station and putting the biometrics of the whole country in the CIDR. So the way I like to say it, uh, gastronomically speaking, is surveillance is like salt in cooking. Essential in tiny quantities, counterproductive, even if slightly in excess. Yeah, so that's the, that's the best way to remember it. But mathematically, you can represent it and I can explain it. Unfortunately, my drawing chops are poor, so otherwise this diagram would have been on in front of you. So I'm going to sort of wave in the air and hopefully you will get it. <laughs> uh, so assume on the vertical axis we have security. Yeah? And on the horizontal axis what we have is the percentage of the population under surveillance. Okay. <laughs> I'm in the right place. Will the markers let me down? Yes. So this is the percentage of the population under surveillance. This is 100% of the population under surveillance. And this is zero percentage of the population under surveillance. And this is the amount of security in the state. So uh, I'm going to first draw the line for Canada, and then I'm going to draw the line for India. So Canada had only one terrorist attack, and I think it happened six years ago, and the terrorist was so incompetent that he managed to kill only one person or something like that. So in Canada, there's already a lot of security. We don't need uh, uh, too much surveillance. In order to deal with this residual amount of criminals and terrorists, we need to put the population under, we need to put a small percentage of the population under surveillance. And as soon as we do that, we get some security benefits as soon as we put the small amount of the population under surveillance. And then, as we unnecessarily put the rest of the population under surveillance, we contribute to the honeypot problem. We are unnecessarily connect, collecting sensitive personal data and putting it in a centralized place. And when we do that, that becomes the place where all the terrorists and criminals and uh, uh, bad actors will want to attack. So that is the curve, inverted hockey stick curve for Canada. Now, India is the third most bombed country in the world, so our security is obviously less than Canada. We might need to put a greater percentage of the population under surveillance, but still, roughly in that proportion. And then, if we unnecessarily do surveillance, we also have exactly the same problem. At the moment we put the whole population under surveillance, we have actually exposed everybody to great amounts of risk because we're collecting so much of personal data about them. So that is a bit too complicated to remember, but this is much simpler. Surveillance is like salt in cooking. We absolutely need it. 
We can't run a modern state without surveillance, but we also have to do it uh, in the right proportion, because even if we go slightly over, we are adding, and we are actually creating a separate and distinct uh, security problem. So that's the first, it's a, it's a design principle now. Uh, when you think about designing surveillance systems, think of surveillance as salt. Um, so where should you do the surveillance? Where do you get the best return on investment for your surveillance? Uh, because surveillance costs money, surveillance is not cheap. So you should therefore, uh, if you're thinking about the state as a business person, then you want return on investment. So this is Uman Chandi right on the top, uh, putting surveillance cameras in his office. He was very clever though, he didn't turn uh, the uh, mic on, it was only a video feed. And then after two, three weeks of that, he turned that also off. I think that much transparency was getting too much for him. So uh, the simple principle is that we need uh, transparency at the top first. So uh, rich versus poor, it's better uh, for the state to know what Ratan Tata is discussing in his bedroom. <coughs> Because what Ratan Tata discusses in his bedroom actually impacts the lives of ordinary people. But what a slum dweller is discussing in his or her bedroom uh, does not really impact uh, the future of India as a country. Therefore, no surveillance in the slum and no surveillance for Ratan Tata. Right? So this is the simple uh, principle. Um, transparency mandates in any country should be directly proportionate to power. And privacy protections should be inversely pro pro proportionate to power. How am, I, how am I making this argument? It's there in the law itself. So if you open the RTI Act, which is our transparency law, privacy is an exception to transparency. Privacy is an exception to transparency. The transparency requirement is on the state. The state is expected to be transparent. Privacy is an exception, but if in the public interest that privacy should not be granted, then there is an exception to the exception. Public interest is an exception to the exception in transparency law. So what N.D. Tiwari is doing in the governor's lodge with sex workers, that is in the public interest to know, therefore N.D. Tiwari does not have privacy in the governor's lodge. Even though sexuality comes under private matter, there is a public interest in knowing about N.D. Tiwari's sexuality. When it comes to privacy law, the public interest is the exception to the right. You have a right to privacy, but if it is in the public interest to know what it is that you're doing, maybe for disease control, then because there is the public interest at stake, your individual right to privacy can be infringed. So this balancing act, this the way in which privacy is used as a right to deal with the power asymmetry, to make uh, the powerless feel more powerful, and the way transparency law is used to temper the power of the powerful, both are predicated on the idea of public interest, or the public interest test in both these laws. But the simple way to say it, like a formula, is this. Privacy protections should be inversely proportionate to power, and transparency mandates should be directly proportional to power. The first part, of course, was said by Julian Assange that transparency should be directly proportional to power. I've just added the second line, which is the kind of obvious uh, conclusion. Um, so now we will uh, use my first case study, which is uh, the demon demonetization case study. This is my first Aadhaar case study. And then I won't do the second Aadhaar case study. I'll see if it comes up for questions. It's a little more technical, so I'd maybe skip that and we'll jump directly to the post-gender toilet question, which I think is very interesting. Um, so when the other project was launched uh, at the very beginning, uh, my organization, amongst many other organizations, provided a technical critique and we said that these systems can be easily abused and the system will be used to create more fraud it will actually fuel fraud, it will not reduce fraud. And the demonetization story was a nice time to hear and see that happen. Um, so if you remember, 
When it came to exchange of cash, we were only allowed to exchange 3,000 or 2,000 rupees in each uh, visit to the bank. And uh, for each visit, you had to give a new ID document uh, because that's the way they were rate limiting it. So in Hyderabad and perhaps in many other parts of the world, uh, this began to happen. If you had given your Aadhaar, a photocopy of your Aadhaar card to the mobile shop vendor or to your school or to some other institution like that, uh, those bulk photocopies were being bought by people that wanted to change black money and uh, they would just go through the back door to the bank and hand over to the bank manager uh, 3,000, 4,000 uh, and then they would just take the money out. Because remember when the money was seized, the money was seized in serial number. The money was not seized in random bunches of money. Remember, politicians across all parties were caught with the new currency in large amounts in the weeks that followed the demonetization announcement. And every single one of those photographs was packs of notes. Uh, they weren't random collections of notes, they were serialized notes. And the only way you could have done that is by going to the back door with a collection of photocopies and having collusion from the bank manager. Um, see, it, the, the banks in particular, uh, we were always suspicious of because banks have a business reason uh, for creating ghosts. Uh, if a bank was ever made responsible for enrollment, then since the bank manager has targets for deposits, the bank manager will say, hey, I'll help you create a ghost. Why don't you use three of my fingers and two of your fingers? Very simple methods. There are more sophisticated, sophisticated methods of creating synthetic fingerprints using software, but the much more simpler methods uh, just by arranging your fingers on the device. Uh, so that's why from the beginning, CIS was very clear that banks should not be given the job of enrollment. Anyhow, stage two, when they, determ when they determined that all these fake uh, photocopies are coming into the system, they said they still didn't believe that the bankers were part of the fraud. They always thought that the ordinary citizen was doing criminal things. So therefore, next version of biometrics is very old biometric technology, marking the body with ink uh, and then measuring the mark. And that's a very easy measurement. You can just look at the body and you can see the mark. Very primitive biometrics, but still biometrics. This failed. Next layer of uh, surveillance was introduced. They said uh, every bank must have uh, surveillance cameras, uh, several surveillance cameras. And this resulted in millions and millions of uh, hours of footage being produced. Uh, this caused a whole storage chaos because the banks are not sure where to store all of this data. And n nobody has the time to sit and look through them. And even detecting fraud uh, using such a mechanism will be very complicated. Um, now a small story, small digression to my engineering days. As I said earlier, my only degree is in industrial production engineering. And if you're an engineer from Karnataka, part of your education is you have to drink huge amounts of alcohol. And if you come from a middle class family, you can't afford the huge amounts of alcohol. So my father bought me uh, 386 during my second year of engineering. And I used the 386 to do both desktop publishing and also data entry uh, to feed my uh, alcohol habit, to support my alcohol habit. Now, uh, you're laughing at my <laughs> predicament as a child, as a student. Uh, the, the, uh, one of the jobs we got at that point in time was a data entry job. And uh, we, would, what, we were entering what looked to us to be some kind of telephone directory or something similar to a telephone directory. On the first day and the second day, we did all the data entry very carefully without making a single mistake. We were paid 100%. And we couldn't believe this, that People who drink half the day are getting paid 100%. We made not a single mistake. This must is too good to be true. So on the third day, we introduced two errors on purpose to check if they are checking. And they weren't checking. They just paid us 100%. From the fourth day, we typed total nonsense. <laughs> and much later, I realized that this is the election ID cards that all of you all have got. So if you have mistakes on your election ID cards, 
it's somebody like me that has to be blamed. So, so now, uh, uh, what did the UIDAI do during the enrollment? They did exactly that. They allowed this subcontracting, endless subcontracting, to happen. So these are uh, this is, uh, uh, th this is uh, the number of enrollment operators that have been banned, and you can see the number here. I think at one point they had reached 55,000 at the peak, and of the 55,000, 49,000 of the enrollment agencies have been banned for malpractice. So you can, so whatever the story I told you about the data entry. That happened uh, in the other context, and there was evidence that the authority had, and therefore they blacklisted 49,000. Some of them went as far as creating ghost kits, so that they could create ghosts. There was a whole system of doing that. I won't go into that particular story unless there's curiosity. Um, and um, these are six major cases where bank officials were arrested for corruption and money laundering post demonetization. And what happens after they shut down those 45,000 enrollment centers? They put enrollment centers into the banks, where there is a reason to create ghosts, because you have to hold Havala, uh, you have to hold Benami money. And then they force them to en enroll. They're now saying that if you don't enroll 16 people a day, we're going to fine you. So now they're giving them an incentive to create ghosts as well. So it's, you can't believe how wrong they're getting this. So this is how a surveillance system collapses. Because most people uh, have designed information technology systems within the perimeter of a firm. A firm is very different from nation state. If you do biometric attendance in a university or in forces, you're most probably going to get that right because you're not dealing with major contradictions within the firm. But as uh, Obama tells us, a nation state is not a firm. Uh, apps might work for firms, but they don't work for nation states because nation states are much more complex. And therefore, you have to design it completely differently. If you design it like you were to design it for a firm, you'll end up with the wrong thing. So let me, I've run out of time completely. So let me just go straight to the post-gender toilet uh, question, OK? So this is uh, just to uh, spark off our conversation. This is the different types of sexual harassment. This is a poster by a graphic design studio called Zebra. It's available on Twitter these days a lot uh, as part of the Me Too. So you can see the different offenses, touching, hugging, kissing, pinching, flirting, Blocking path, brushing against someone. Those are all physical in the first uh, area on the top. Verbal, using obscenities, making suggestive comments or jokes, inappropriate humor, making threats, making sexual propositions, remarks on clothing or physical attributes, that's verbal. And nonverbal, staring, obscene gestures, suggestive noises, sexual, sexually suggestive glances, displaying sexual content on print slash computer slash phone. So this, is the, this is the poster that's uh, on Twitter under the MeToo hashtag produced by Zebra. So uh, the first thing to remember about many of the accusations and incidents is these have happened in private spaces where there is no surveillance. So it becomes his account versus her account. That's the first complication with this. Um, and some of these, out of the list of uh, actions of sexual harassment, some of them can happen within a toilet as well. Uh, and it might happen uh, amongst men also. A man can touch another man or hug another man. All of that is also possible. Uh, so that. Potentially, uh, three solutions to the question of what to do with transgender persons. The first uh, solution is that you create one more toilet. You have a men, male's toilet, female's toilet, and then you have a, a, a transgender toilet as well. 
Or you have a policy where uh, transgender persons are sent to one of the toilets. You say that all transgender persons will be sent to the male toilet or the female toilet, or based on their destination gender, you will choose which toilet they want to go to. Or uh, uh, you can have one single toilet. You can have a post-gender toilet. Yep. But the problem here could happen in any of those toilets, because most toilets have some semi-private space before you enter the cubicle. Some semi-private space before you enter the cubicle. Therefore, at a recent meeting that I attended, and this was to police the behavior of school children, they introduced surveillance cameras in the toilet, in the semi-private space of the toilet. So you get privacy only when you enter the cubicle. So I thought about that quite a bit. On the one hand, we want to protect people. On the other hand, full-blown video surveillance is very intrusive, right? But if somebody actually spanked somebody or hugged somebody, you'd like to be able to say whether this happened or not. So what's the, uh, what is the solution? One solution could be sonar-based uh, surveillance. Because in a sonar system, uh, you can determine whether objects are still, whether they're moving, whether they're approaching each other, whether they are uh, moving away from each other, whether they make contact with each other briefly, whether they make contact with each other for extended periods of time. So this is, you could have a sonar-based surveillance system in a toilet, and using the sonar-based surveillance system, you can even tell whether two people have gotten to the same cubicle. All sorts of things can be told. Uh, then I thought about it. Uh, in India, we don't even have money to have proper toilets in public institutions. How are we going to afford this sonar-based surveillance? So then maybe the architecture of toilets need to change uh, itself. The reason why we need this sonar-based surveillance is we are ashamed of acts of defecation and urination. We are there's sort of stigma attached to it. So we have a big building, but the toilet is in the side. The, uh, here the toilet, you have to walk all the way to the side, and in the corner there's a toilet. So toilets have to become the centerpiece of buildings. <laughs> yep. So you have, you have circular toilets cut up in cubicles like pieces of cake, and whenever anybody enters any cubicle, everybody can see them enter the cubicle. So toilets are under peer surveillance constantly, non-technologically enabled peer surveillance constantly, then you don't need the technologically enabled surveillance. So um, just to say that I'm going slowly mad by <laughs> thinking about uh, surveillance for far too long, but I'd love to open this out and talk about uh, surveillance in any context, uh, primary schools, uh, college hostels, Pinjara, Thord, and all of that. Uh, these are all very important questions about how to get surveillance right, because it's quite a complex optimization a uh, problem that uh, policymakers are trying to solve. They want to uphold individual rights, but there are also larger imperatives that they have to consider. So over to you. Sorry for taking so long. I mean, let's open it up for discussion. It's better than going through one more case study. Is, it, is that? I have another case study in case there are no questions, I shall traumatize you with one more case. <laughs> there are always surprises when Sunil is around. <laughs> um, questions or comments, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Point. It can also be solutions. You can have alternative <laughs> solutions to surveillance. No. It basically, it basically uh, adds to the account, because when somebody complains, they will say, on this time and on this time, something happened to me in the toilet. And then you can see during that time whether there was a coalition or so. So it, it corroborates. Yes, I mean, that, 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 that's surely a possibility. That, that's surely a possibility. So surveillance system in the urban canyons of Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, the buildings are so tall 
that the streets form urban canyons and the wind passes through these urban canyons. So they need to monitor the pollution and various environmental parameters in the urban canyon because you may be at the 10th floor, you will be facing one particular weather system, but on the 30th floor, you will have a completely different weather system. So they have surveillance cameras to monitor all the traffic, but on purpose, they have low res cameras because they want to say that's an SUV, but they don't want to say whose SUV because the moment they know whose SUV, the police want that data. These are environmentalists. They want to protect uh, the environmental conditions. They're not interested in telling the police who took which SUV to which protest and so on. So, so on purpose, the resolution of the surveillance is a very important question to ask. How much resolution do we need this surveillance to happen, have? If the resolution is too high, you will get uh, pictures of the panties of three-year-olds from a nursery because you're doing surveillance in the nursery in the nursery to protect them from sexual violence. You'll be creating child pornography when you're trying to protect um, uh, children from s sexual violence. This is the problem with the resolution of the device. So this is just my solution. You could want uh, full-blown video cameras in the toilet, and that would be your solution. <laughs> I think the gentleman over there had a question, and I think uh, Padmini has a question. Uh, two related questions. So uh, one is, as a is there a generalization about the introduction of surveillance and the outcomes? I mean, does just over time, whatever you're introducing surveillance for, does the system go to a new equilibrium to, you know, if you're going to have crime or whatever, does it just work its way around the technology? That's the first question. Second is, in different societies, when you introduce surveillance, do you merely enhance what was pre-existing or does technology override culture? So like in England, after, in the last 20, 30 years, every three meters now they have cameras. But English society is different from Indian society, right? So does technology override culture and history and everything or does it work? I mean, I don't know if I asked the question correctly. Yeah. The, the second question, I. I don't really feel competent to answer because I haven't uh, uh, stu studied it uh, sufficiently. Um, the first question is easier because there's a body of research around it. Uh, surveillance mostly helps detect crimes of passion. Premeditated crimes, uh, when the criminals already know how the police operate, they will always do uh, the crime in the blank spots of the surveillance, where the surveillance does not, so th they, will, they will adapt. You could, you could see the variety of adaption that happened in the demonetization story. So criminals will always, ad whenever there is crime-busting technology version one, one, it will be followed by uh, criminal technology version two and so on. So that's the endless uh, catch-up game between criminals and people doing surveillance. Uh, therefore, in the Netherlands, in the UK, there has been a lot of criticism for the number of surveillance cameras because there is no value for that uh, degree of surveillance. You could get almost the same results with much less. Uh, whether surveillance has a homogenizing cultural impact, that's, uh, I, I haven't thought about that enough. Uh, to answer. Maybe somebody else in this room has uh, a response to that. Take a moment, like for example, if you look at the bank scams you read of today, 91,000 crores. So 50 years ago you might have stolen a banana or you might have taken a 10 rupee note. And now <laughs> you're going to 91,000 crores. So but this is at a time of extraordinary technology. So it doesn't seem to be making sense to, to an ordinary person. I mean, I don't know if you've read these figures in the newspaper. 91,000 crores is the reason. How does this work? I mean, uh, because uh, uh, stealing a banana from a supermarket uh, will end up with your face on a camera. Uh, that is evidence which you will find much harder to repudiate. Suppose you uh, are an anonymous actor on the internet, on the dark web, and you're attacking a bank uh, through that channel, you have much higher chance of getting away uncaught, despite of all the surveillance. So 
uh, given the volumes of data that are being sent up and down the pipes, because all of us have devices, and almost all these devices are now connected devices, 50% of the planet has devices, and many of us have multiple devices. So the volumes are so huge that even with sophisticated surveillance technology, it's very hard for them to tell what is going on. Even with big data analytics, very hard for them to tell what's going on. Increasingly, criminals and activists are coming up with technologies that allow you to obfuscate uh, the signal. So you might be on one website, but a lot of unnecessary traffic is generated pretending that you're on other websites. And all of that makes it harder and harder for the police to make their case. So, so those, are not equal, those are not equivalent crimes from a surveillance, from a surveillance exposure perspective. Uh, physical crimes still have much higher surveillance consequences. Digital crimes, because you can always go back and give an alternative account for why the digital trails shows that. My uncle was using my computer, I was not at home, and so on and so forth. So I feel I'm not answering your Where question. <laughs> Padmini. Uh, the, the gentleman at the back after Padmini. Um, so thanks a lot for that. <laughs> Great fun. Um, so just a kind of, a, I guess, a clarification and a question. The clarification is that when you're saying um, operating at different levels of resolution, is that more or less analogous to metadata? Like, so, you know, if you're doing low-res camera capture, is that akin to the metadata rather than the data itself, would you say? Or no. is that it's still data? Quality, but it's quality of data. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, actually, two, two things. One was about the, the trans issue and about how, so if somebody identifies as queer, what box identifies them and how the state identifies them or the, how they are read by the state will obviously differ, right? Um, so how does that, I mean, how do we work with the fact that we as people are often fluid in, you know, our yep. choices, etc., and so how that obviously defies any kind of, you know, database logic, right? So, you know, but is there a way in which you think about surveillance that can accommodate that? Uh, and the second question, which pertains to me too, um, is what I'm kind of imagining as the labor of surveillance, right? Like, so I think there are three kinds of um, kind of gazes in this conversation. One is testimony, one is witness, and one is surveillance, right? And so am I, if I am the, the victim, the onus is on most women to create the labor of surveillance. Right? And of course, the state's response is that we will create the surveillance, so you are fine, so you know, you're protecting apps and all of this. But how do we, apart from just educating people <laughs> about patriarchy, um, how else, I mean, are there any other ways in which we can uh, kind of come to this discussion about by kind of uh, posing it as labor and saying that you know, th this is unfair labor of surveillance for women you know, and kind of take it in that direction? Yeah. So, um, I mean, the first question, which is the distinction between the state doing medical surveillance and using, using medical technology to define your identity and your own right to self-identify. Um, uh, I think it's best as a society going forward to bank much more on the second modality, which is allow people to self-identify. And one way to tell that story, because I haven't studied medical surveillance sufficiently, uh, is to think of a set of aged people that want to share some of their data with Facebook for medical research, because they all suffer from a common medical condition. So they're all uh, uh, hardcore Facebook users, and therefore they'd like to share this data with Facebook. So it's much better if a nonprofit organization uh, has a uh, deal with this collective of aged persons and through this nonprofit person as a data trust the data is then passed on to scientific uh, researchers medical researchers but at the same time that nonprofit says that that because these people have this condition we are willing to take responsible advertising targeting this population yeah so it's only voluntarily 
that if you're an aged person and if you have the condition, you can voluntarily participate in this medical experiment by providing personal information for the benefits of science, but you're doing it because you're voluntarily identifying yourself as somebody who has that condition. Facebook is not guessing that of you. Now, with sports, what I heard is the definition of a woman is based on the amount of testosterone that you have in your body. So that's, I think, the history of identification, because that's how the state saw. Increasingly, because the technology will make it possible, I think various groups will be able to identify themselves, even using data. So that's, uh, that's the answer to uh, the, the first question. Uh, could you quickly repeat part of the second question? I've... Yeah, the, the, labor, the labor of surveillance. So I think it can be shifted very easily, just like um, police are forced to use body cams. So you could force uh, the more powerful actor in the transaction as uh, you could force them to do surveillance on themselves. So police have body cams in the US, and the body cams also record, record what they say, sure. and they're not allowed to turn it on. How, how would you envision that? It, it will have to be uh, the law. So if you're a taxi driver, then you have to carry a wire on yourself all the time. Because the so question is, to what degree do we want that surveillance? Because then that same wire will pick up the conversation that you're having with your friend at the back seat of the car. This already happens in Japan. Yeah. In Japan, already, it already says, as you enter the taxi, that all your conversation will be recorded for your safety. And they have decided to make that bargain. Uh, but I, I think that's the best way to fix it, which is to force the more, because working from that principle, which is privacy protection should be inversely proportionate to power. If you are powerful, then it should be an expectation that you will have surveillance technology on your side. Yeah. Yes. No, this is the time for men to be under surveillance. I'm not. But even in an, like, if we look at it and look at it in an intersectional way, like, you know, a Dalit man is less privileged than a white man. Like, yes. who has the right? Yes. 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 Yeah, I mean, most, most policy interventions and laws deal with the majority case. The, the exception is always, uh, law finds it very diff difficult to deal with uh, exceptions. That's, that's usually where all the confusion starts. Uh, so the question at the back. Yeah. Yes, the gentleman at the back. So since you've been speaking about power as well, and I think that was the Julian uh, earlier told that uh, the, the transparency should be yeah. Which is exactly what we would like to strive towards. But then the question arises is uh, how do you give power to people who are not in power to make these decisions? Because the ones that are in power, like Ratan Tata, he's the one who can, who is more influential in making decisions, right? So, how, how to give power to the powerless? Yes, more or less. No, that's, that's, that's the kind of I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, that's that's much. That's yeah, because the ones that don't have power, the people would like to ban pork, but it just doesn't have a say, right? Say that sentence one more time. People would like to ban pork. Yes. It just doesn't have a say. Yes. So how do you, you know, I mean, like for example, for example, you gave the example of the demonetization bit as well. Yes. So at the end of it, I think there was a caveat which said that political parties could uh, deposit as much of money as they want, and they wouldn't be asked. They were out of purview because. Again, yes. Who are making yes. decisions that are safeguarding themselves, right? Yes. So uh, I think uh, I don't know. I don't know whether surveillance can be used to transfer power from one entity to another, but surveillance can definitely used to temper power. So if you go back to the old ration shop uh, example, here we are placing every single person that consumes rations under surveillance. There's a large number of people under surveillance and we're using biometric technology for that surveillance. You could have a completely different vision of surveillance for subsidized food. So from Delhi to the village, 
Every government official that is responsible for moving grain, step by step, put them under surveillance, make them provide a non-repudiable record using cryptography, saying that I have sent this grain to this village, or I have sent this grain to this district headquarters. Make all of that information publicly available on a website. So if a person in a particular village wants to know the chain of government officials that were involved in the various decisions that resulted in grain reaching the fair price shop, they can see all of that. The uh, media can investigate it. So if the bureaucracy or the netas and the babus are under surveillance in this particular fashion, where we're tracking money and goods flow from Delhi to the village, then it makes them less powerful. It makes them less capable of abusing their discretionary powers and so on. So it is possible. What we need is targeted surveillance at the top of the pyramid and much less surveillance at the bottom of the pyramid. At the moment, for some reason, the country is convinced that it's the poor and the ordinary people that are responsible for all this fraud. That's not true at all. If you're following frauds and scams, most of them happen on the top of the pyramid, not at the bottom of the pyramid. It's not a full answer. I'm struggling to answer questions from your erudite audience. <laughs> Another question? Yes. Yeah, so uh, what I always uh, uh, try to avoid using is the word balance, uh, because balance makes it sound as if this is a zero-sum game. If we have more privacy, we'll have less national security. And if we have less national security, we'll have more privacy. That's not true at all. Uh, they're not connected in that way. As I showed in the inverted hockey stick graph, they actually have a strange relationship. Some small curtailment of the right to privacy might increase national security, if done properly. So the relationship is not a zero-sum game. Uh, and because it is not a zero-sum uh, relationship, uh, we can hope to maximize. So it's like solving a maximization function. If we do the right amount of surveillance on the right population, then we get national security benefits. And if we overdo it and go to mass surveillance, which is at 100%, then we actually undermine surveillance because anybody can get into anybody's communication because everything is so fragile at that point in time. I'm not saying it as well as I should be saying it. <laughs> yes? Hi, I have two questions. Yes. Um, you know, largely what you spoke about uh, when you said that uh, uh, surveillance in a firm is very different from surveillance in a state. Yeah. Um, just, I mean, to take the first part forward, would you say that what Google and what social media platforms do with the data they get can be looked upon as surveillance? That's yeah. one question. And secondly, you know, when you articulated the principle of uh, transparency being directly proportionate to power, if we just look at the Indian context, uh, and if one were to look at political party funding, that's been completely obfuscated. There yeah. is so, yeah. that itself tells you that there is no way we're going to achieve this principle, <laughs> right? I mean, so how does one navigate, because the people in power are the ones who are making our laws. They're the lawmakers. So how does one sort of navigate or reconcile yeah. that? Uh, two very important uh, questions. Um, so what Google does is surveillance, because Google knows more about what you're doing. Uh, and sometimes Google knows more about you than yourself as well. Uh, yeah, that, Any time you go to Chrome, they automatically sign you in. There's yes. no sign off to that. Like yes. you can't even opt out anymore. Yes. So you can only just switch your browser. Yes. yes. So uh, the, 
most of what Google is collecting about you is through its ad network. So it's not what you're doing on Google Maps or what you're doing on Google search engine that's important. It's wherever you go on the internet, Google is following you and they know everything that you're doing on the internet. That's the biggest threat. And that's why uh, law, law enforcement is so keen to get Google data whenever there are cases, because you can tell a lot from that data. Uh, when it comes to the second question, uh, it may be just that I'm middle-aged, I'm very optimistic that if you work really hard for decades and decades, uh, things will change. It takes 10 years to get a treaty through the World Intellectual Property Organization, 10 or 15 years. It takes 10 or 15 years to get a law through Indian Parliament. So that's the, that's the speed of change. So political parties will have to become transparent at some point uh, if Indian democracy has to survive, and that will happen. But it's not going to happen today, tomorrow. It's going to, have, it's going to take 10, 15 years. So uh, be prepared to run marathons. This is not a, this is not a race. This, I, mean, I, I cannot afford uh, the skepticism of the youth because I'm middle-aged. <laughs> if I do that, then there's nothing left for me to live. <laughs> Uh, I don't know who was. We'll have one last question. Janavi, from Jitu. No, it's Jitu. Um, no, you talked about surveillance uh, by a firm. Yes. And surveillance, designing surveillance by a firm, which is that of the state. How how would the state, I mean, design surveillance? Are you saying the design is from our down? Oh, you know, from the far more powerful to the the less powerful? Is that how you would design? No, surveillance? no. Uh, I think the most important distinction is to realize that anybody who wants to, uh, so, so in, a, in a firm, uh, basically the distrusted actors are outside the perimeter of the firm. And everybody inside the firm is trusted. You know, this is the, this is the trust model of a firm. Now suppose uh, the Hyderabad police told the Karnataka police, that see, when we did this encounter killing, we got caught from the CDR records. So what you should do is you should have a good relationship with uh, two of the telcos. These are the people that you're planning to do encounter. These are the two telcos that they use. If you know the network administrators, we can tamper the CDR itself. We can change the CDR, because after all, CDR is just a database held by the telco. So in a state, you have to assume that any actor cannot be trusted. I mean, all actors cannot be trusted. So uh, that is why technical means like cryptography is used for non-repudiation. Every time anybody does anything to anybody else, then you get them to use cryptography to sign and say they have done it. Then later you can say, hey, you did it, and so on. So, so, so it's really uh, cryptography and technical means that are used to bridge the trust deficit and also Working with uh, the infrastructure of the community. So suppose we only had a black box filled with proprietary software that will tell us whether a biometric is unique or not unique, and if that is the way we are going to decide whether these are residents or not residents of India, very easy to defeat that black box. Uh, go to uh, Paris, set up a shop saying that you're an astrologer, collect high quality biometrics, and register it against the CIDR, you'll get UID numbers. Right? It's a very simple attack. All you have to do is collect unique biometrics. If, on the other hand, you said that for us to recognize you, we want two of your neighbors to vouch for you, that comes with its own complications in a country where there are cup panchayats. But that's a different modality where you're not trusting a centralized black box, but you're allowing the social network and the social fabric of the country to act as its system of checks and balances. So the difference between designing for a state and designing for a firm is not bottom-up versus top-down. It is uh, the trust model and the threat model is very different for nation-state, very different uh, for a firm, and therefore the details of the technology have to be rather different. That's, yeah. that's so, so that, yeah. and coming to the really the last question, <laughs> so what, I mean, can you comment then on the future of all this, the UID and other, and also, uh, you know, where do you think it might go? Yeah, so that's the sort of yeah. 
segue that you've given me to my second case study. Uh, so this is our report uh, where we reported uh, six, uh, on the 1st of May 2017 that 130 million other numbers could have been potentially leaked by four government transparency websites. And along with that, 100 uh, million bank details could have also been potentially leaked. This is what our report said. Uh, for this report, we have been sent several legal notices, and therefore we stopped research. So uh, the vision originally when uh, UID was designed is that you would have multiple databases, and this is the NAT grid really, but you have multiple databases, and the other number is the unique key in all these databases. That was the original vision. We said that's a very bad idea because it makes the attack surface huge. You just attack any of these databases and then you get large number of other numbers. So that was why we said that we had proposed tokenization, and that's the first thing they did, which they started coming up with virtual ID numbers and tokenization. That's one method of dealing with it. This is their latest solution. So the Supreme Court has not ruled in our favor. The dissent is in our favor, where, say, where the dissent says the project is unconstitutional and should be destroyed. But even the majority decision does not allow private actors to use the other database for KYC or authentication. Both those are prohibited. And I've got confirmation from the UIDAI itself. So now you can generate an offline Aadhaar card. This will contain a digitally signed QR code, which is signed by the authority, and only the four last digits of your Aadhaar number. When you go to Airtel to get, or Airtel is perhaps a bad idea, when you go to a bank account and you want to use your offline Aadhaar card in this offline verification modality, you give them the card, they will scan the QR code, and they will read your phone number from it then they will ask you if you have the same phone number. If you do, using their SMS gateway, they will send you an SMS, and you can then respond to the OTP using your device. Then they know that you're the same person for that other number. So this is offline verification. What does it eliminate? It eliminates the 360-degree surveillance that was possible previously by looking at the CIDR. Just looking at the transaction logs in the CIDR, you can guess what is going on. Uh, because each device has got its own set of keys, so each device can be identified. Second is uh, the whole uh, verification is uh, distributed, and therefore there is no central point of attack. So a lot of, uh, in a sense, the Supreme Court, to say it in another way, is forcing the other project to implement privacy by design by placing such restrictions on them. So that's what's going to happen. I, I think either there will be massive disaster because we get all the details wrong, or incrementally we are going to dig ourselves out of this hole. That's the... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no. This is just QR code. It's like no, some no. of the oldest technologies can be very good. You don't need blockchain. It's just QR code. No, but if it's an open ledger, like if it's decentralized... No, no. no. It's, not, it's not public. It's not, okay. it's not decentralized in that sense. Uh, blockchain is decentralized in the sense that every node is an actor. Here, decentralized in the sense that Airtel's authentication will have nothing to do with, uh, Vodafone's authentication will have nothing to do with. In Thank you so much for your patience. This is not really interesting topic, but thanks for staying.